Hello, friends, and welcome. Thank you for joining me on this first of what we hope will be a number of videos that will follow in our attempts to bring God's word to you and into your home, especially during this time of the coronavirus crisis. And I'd like to just take a quick second to thank Merle Erickson, along with my daughter, Mary Ramirez, who have provided so much help in putting this together and making it possible for us to come to you in this manner. Now, the content of this particular video will be the sermon for Sunday, March 29th, which will then be followed by a prayer uh, and then the benediction. We don't have any music uh, or any of the other parts of the liturgy uh, in this service, so it'll be kind of a devotional uh, video for you. And please feel free to let us know how these videos are helping, or if they're not helping, we want to know that too. And if you have any ideas as to how we can uh, make these videos better, uh, because our goal is simply to communicate God's law and gospel to you so that your faith can grow and flourish. Today, we're going to be looking at John's Gospel, chapter 11. And we're going to be focusing specifically on verses 17 to 27, and then we'll jump to verses 38 to 45. If you'd like to follow along with your own Bibles, boy, you're certainly welcome to do just that. And so, as we begin, I want to extend to you, uh, to all of you, the grace, peace, and mercy from God, our Heavenly Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loves you and who cares for you, and you can be sure will get you through this crisis that not only our country, but the whole world is undergoing. Today's gospel is a familiar one, I believe, to many of you, because it recounts the story of Jesus miraculously raising Lazarus from the dead. But what we want to glean from these words today of our text is that the death of Lazarus actually had a divine earthly purpose. And that's what we're going to explore today. And so we begin with verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And then we skip down to verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. This is our text, and we pray. Lord Jesus, these are your words. Your word is truth. Sanctify us 
enlighten us and guide us through your word of truth. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, dear fellow redeemed, I want you to imagine this. A messenger comes to you and he tells you your friend is very sick. You know that your friend's family wants you to come immediately and do something to help. But instead of dropping everything and making tracks quickly to your friend's home, you wait. You wait for two days. Then you finally say to your companions, okay, let's go. But they're very hesitant. And they actually try to change your mind because your friend's home is in the heart of enemy territory. There are very powerful people there who seek to kill you. When you tell your companions, my friend is asleep and I want to make him well, they reply, well, if he's asleep, he'll get well. And you know what they mean. He'll be okay. So there's really no good reason for you or for any of us to risk our lives just to make a sick call. End of story. Now, what I've just told you is how a Bible might read that doesn't want you to hear about Jesus and his miracles. Because clearly my story left out some critical details. So let's get back to real life. And in real life, we learn how Jesus responded to that message that was brought to him. We read it there in verse 4. So we're up above uh, by several verses in our text. And Jesus says this. He says, this sickness does not have of its, as its goal death, but to give glory to God so that God's Son may be glorified by it. So when it was time to travel, the disciples did balk because they were thinking that the sleeping Lazarus would get well on his own. But in verse 15, again, this is just prior to our text, Jesus told them in plain words, Lazarus has died. And I'm glad that I was not there. It will help you believe. And see, it's from that verse then that we're correct to conclude that the death of Lazarus actually had a divine earthly purpose. Now, and that's the, basically the theme of our sermon today. Now, in the verses of our text, we see two purposes. First, Jesus made himself Martha's center of interest. And secondly, Jesus was glorified by the resurrection of Lazarus. If we make a quick review of the timetable, the fact is that by the time that Jesus got the message about Lazarus, even if he had hopped on the red-eyed camel express, Lazarus would have already been dead before he arrived. Martha is aware of that math. But when Martha heard that Jesus had come, she left the house to meet Jesus somewhere outside the city. And with her first words to him, Lord, if you were here, my brother would not have died. That was not a reprimand. There was no reprimanding tone in her voice, as if the delay of Jesus showed a lack of caring on his part. No, she is simply stating that if Jesus had in fact been in town when Lazarus came down with this, this disease, Jesus could have healed him with a miracle. But Jesus wasn't around. And that sickness consumed Lazarus so quickly that her brother died in a matter of days. But you see, in Martha's eyes, Jesus was a great prophet whom God had empowered to do miracles. But she had not come to that certain knowledge and understanding that Jesus is more than a prophet. Jesus is true God, one in essence with the Heavenly Father. However, that was about to change as Jesus made himself Martha's center of interest. Martha remembered in her grief the return message from Jesus as it was reported to her when he said, this sickness does not have as, as its goal death, 
but to give glory to God so that God's Son may be glorified by it. And she brings this up by affirming, I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. See what she's doing? She's expressing hope, but she doesn't know exactly what to hope for. And so Jesus assists her to believe in him as the one who, by virtue of his own power, could indeed raise her brother. But when Jesus assures her, your brother will rise again, she doesn't think it's going to be on that day with a miracle. Now, do you see what's happening here? Jesus is steering the conversation. He's using the gospel to bring comfort in a time of grief. And Martha expresses her faith in what she has learned. She says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. She understands that. Jesus, though, purposely made possible that interpretation, the interpretation, the correct ones, of his words. And his goal is to have people like you and like me to focus our faith squarely on Jesus where it's supposed to be. Because you see, Martha's brother was the focus of her thoughts at that moment. And then she pushed the fast forward button in her mind and she saw the day when life will be returned to all of the dead bodies from Adam on. So what Jesus does is he brings Martha back from judgment day to the present day. He turns her away from Lazarus. He doesn't say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. No, he announces, this is who I am. And see, it's vital. It's vital for everyone that we have a clear understanding of our Lord's true identity. I am the resurrection, he says. He is the source. He is the power. The one from whom resurrection comes. We can't have resurrection if we don't have Jesus. He who raised himself from the dead because he is God is the very one who raises us as well with that same exact power. I am the life, he declares. If we're not connected to Jesus, we're dead. Now I know, the unbeliever on earth has a heart that's pumping blood through the body and, and lungs that are sucking in and breathing out air, oxygenating that blood that's flowing all through them. But the soul in that person is separated from God. That soul is dead. And if we're not connected with Jesus, we stay dead. The body and soul of the unbeliever on Judgment Day will be separated from God's blessings forever in hell. It's called eternal death. And it's a place where the screams of agony never stop. It's the eternal punishment of experiencing physically with the body the intense agonizing torment and pain of paying God for their sins. And it's experiencing with emotions the loneliness, the heartache, and the depression from never again being loved. And the despair that comes with the reality that this condition never ends. Hell, dear friends, is never something to be laughed about or thought of as being no big deal. Because, oh, yes, it is. This is why Jesus comforts Martha and why it's so welcomed by the ears and the heart of all of us. The one who believes, Jesus says, will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Like the two sisters in our gospel reading today. And like you and me. Who believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Our death will not be forever. But simply, our death will move us into 
deathlessness. Now, I know that's not a word, but that's what it is. No death. Our body, the part of us that is affected by death, will one day emerge victoriously from the grave to be reunited with our soul that will never die. Now understand, I'm speaking here of the Christian only. We rejoice that at death, we lose forever our sinful natures whom we keep putting off in this life and putting out by daily repentance and contrition and by resisting temptation. But it keeps sneaking back, doesn't it, into our thoughts and into our choices like an intruder. As Luther once said, we have to drown our sinful natures in the waters of baptism. But it's a good swimmer. So we have to drown that sinful nature every day. And it is with the Apostle Paul that we too say, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. We know by experience all about the sinful nature. Well, our Lord's response to Martha told her that, or what I should say he intended to do. And he asked her point blank, he says, do you believe this? And what a model of faith her answer is when she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. Now, see what's happened here? Now, Martha expresses her faith that fo focuses squarely on Jesus, right where it's supposed to be. Because he is the Christ, the very one that God chose to come into the world to give us life. Life that overcomes death. Jesus is the Son of God, which makes him God with authority and power over everything, including death and the grave. Death and the grave, of course, being that they're wanting to hold on to us forever. So the time finally came for Jesus to show Martha the application of the faith, her faith in him that she expressed. Jesus was indeed glorified by the resurrection of Lazarus. Our Savior went to the cemetery to fulfill his promise because it was there that Jesus commanded, take away the stone. But Martha failed to apply the lesson that Jesus had taught her, and so she protested, didn't she? Running up to him, but Lord, Lord, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. And Jesus lovingly reprimanded, reprimanded her, I should say, by saying to her, did I not tell you? Did I not tell you, Martha, that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Now, as you heard our text read earlier, did you notice that Jesus thanked God in advance? Because this victory over death was a foregone conclusion. So then Jesus called out to a dead Lazarus in the grave and his word, that's the power of his word, restored life with the same power, by the way, which it gave to all of creation. Death's bony fingers had to release Lazarus' body and there in the last verse of our text, it reveals to us that when Jesus ordered them to take off his, his grave clothes, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did, did you catch it? Put their faith in him. Jesus glorified. See how the death of Lazarus had a divine earthly purpose. It gave Jesus the circumstances to perform the greatest miracle of his ministry, to prove to us the certainty of his greatest promise. The reality is that death has hounded mankind ever since the Garden of Eden. 
And it's caused untold misery that God never intended for his creation to bear. When Christ saw the effects of death on his loved ones, he wept. He wept for them. He felt the pain. But he also promised them that one day, even this last enemy known as death would be defeated. Martha, too often, I think, remembered for her busyness. Remember when the Lord came and they were going to have him for dinner and over for dinner. And Martha's busy in the kitchen getting all the things ready. And Mary is at his feet listening to every word. But really, Martha should be remembered for her confession of faith, so complete and so noble that encompasses everything Jesus had proclaimed. It even encompassed teachings that the disciples struggled to comprehend themselves. She believed in Jesus' promise of a future resurrection. And so Jesus provided a real, honest, physical proof to her and to everyone who was there, as well as to us, that his promise of resurrection is absolutely true. It's not a pipe dream. It's reality. Because as the Apostle Paul revealed in another letter, his letter to the Galatians, he said, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem stable, was and is the world's Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. He lived his life holy and pure, keeping the law of God for us perfectly. He then died an innocent death on Calvary's cross not for his sake, but in our place, to pay in full the penalty for all of our sins. It was there that Jesus defeated Satan and sin and, yes, death itself. Because when Jesus entered into death, he tore it apart so that we would not die a spiritual death. But it didn't end there because he rose again from the grave. And God accepted his payment for our sins. God can and has declared sinners righteous. In other words, we've been made right with God because of what Christ accomplished for us on the cross. Indeed, it was all done for us. Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, will also give resurrection and life to all, every single one of us who believes in his victory in this battle over death. But Lazarus' response to the command of Christ stirs the heart of every Christian who has stared at the ugly face of death. The dead man came out. This event along with the glorious celebration of each Easter, which is just right around the corner, they provide a powerful prelude to Judgment Day and the absolute certainty of our own resurrection. Let that always be a source of comfort to you, dear people, as we journey together to our heavenly home, a home where we will be eternally And now the peace that passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds firmly planted in the risen Christ. Amen. And so, dear ones, let us bow before the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, please accept our humble thanks for becoming one of us, that as the Word made flesh, you fulfilled all that was necessary for our eternal redemption. You were tempted by Satan in every way and found to be faithful. And now your perfect obedience to God's will 
is credited to our account. Bearing our sins, you willingly went the agonizing way of the cross, where God laid on you the iniquity of us all. And so the law has been kept, and the price of sin has been paid, and you have done it all. And now no one, not even Satan himself, whom you struck down, can accuse us of sin. Through you, and you alone, we are fully pardoned by our gracious God. What joy and peace we truly have in our hearts, knowing that we are saved, saved by your sacrifice, and washed clean by your shed blood. May the message of the cross and all that you accomplished by it for our salvation never fail to inspire us. Keep the pleasures and the treasures and the cares of this life from ever replacing your cross in our hearts. Remind us daily to lay down our burdens of sin at the cross and there find true heartfelt comfort in the pardon that you won for us. Govern our lives by the cross that we, as we witness through your word and in spirit, the sufferings that you endured for our sins. Help us, Lord, to learn more and more to hate sin and love righteousness. Through that message of mercy and forgiveness by way of the cross, strengthen us and encourage us and guide us all our days. Keep the cross uppermost in our minds and hearts whenever we pray to our Heavenly Father so that our prayers find acceptance with Him. And dear Father in Heaven, Creator and Preserver of all things, we thank You for the grace and mercy You have shown to all people, especially in sending Your Son, Your only Son, to be our Savior from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Be with us during this time of sickness, fear, and doubt. Let your word bring comfort and hope to all who hear it, calming our fears and providing strength for each day. Give our leaders the wisdom to make decisions that will help our people with their earthly needs and protect us from all harm. Protect our doctors and nurses and all who provide care to the sick and to those who cannot care for themselves. Give them an extra measure of strength and help through this difficult time. We pray that you will also provide calm and peaceful days as together we face this coronavirus crisis together. Remind each of us of our responsibilities to our neighbor and that we consider others in all the decisions that we make. And above all, we pray that your will be done. And dear Savior, may we always stand before your cross filled with amazement at the love you displayed for us there. Let us never be offended at your cross, but boldly confess it as the means by which sinners like ourselves have been redeemed and where we now triumph over sin and hell. And when a cross enters our lives, Give us grace through the Holy Spirit to bear it after you, thankful for the privilege of suffering for your name's sake. And finally, we pray that one day you will exchange our cross for a crown, bringing us into eternal life in your heaven. It is in your precious name, dear Lord and Savior, that we pray and ask for these things. Amen. And now we pray together the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now, dear ones in Christ, receive our Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant to you his peace. Amen and amen.
Thank you for being with us here today, and our prayer is that your faith has been strengthened through the proclamation of God's word, and may God continue to bless your daily walk with him. Until next time.